CD Projekt Red's RPG series The Witcher, adapted from novels written by Andrzej Sapowski, is absolutely huge. The sheer cultural domination of the monster-slaying, wench-boning antics of the gravelly-voiced Geralt of Rivia really started to emerge with its third title, The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. Wild Hunt did absolute gangbusters in sales and in its critical reception, and the surge in renown that it brought to both the studio and the franchise still has a hold on the games industry to this day, five years on from its initial release. It started to get a bit of a hold um, on the television industry too, with a Netflix series adapted primarily from the books, but with plenty of influence on Geralt's appearance and mannerisms taken from the game. Henry Cavill's a gamer, didn't you know? This isn't the first foray into movie magic when it comes to the world of The Witcher, though. For a start, there was a mediocre film called The Hexer, the original translation of the series' name. Followed by a TV show of the same name. And let's not forget the cinematic trailers released in anticipation of the aforementioned Witcher 3. <sighs> it's these trailers that I'll be taking a look at in this episode of Mise on Cutscene, specifically how they borrow a range of classic cinematic techniques to make Geralt look really f***ing cool. First up, let me introduce you to my friend, the Graphic Match Cut. Sounds like a move Geralt might perform on a monster's neck, but it's actually a type of transitional cut where two otherwise unrelated scenes in a film or TV show are given a deeper sense of connection by matching shapes, colours and composition. 2001, a Space Odyssey's cut from a bone flying through the air to a satellite weapon orbiting the Earth symbolises the violent evolution of man. In Schindler's List, there's a cut from a snuffed out candle to the chimney of a concentration camp steam train, a metaphor for the snuffing out of life. And this cut in Jurassic Park The Lost World is just funny. Basically, a graphic match cut can be used in all sorts of different ways to communicate all sorts of different things. The Trail, The Witcher 3's opening cinematic, which was released as a trailer before the game released, shows us Geralt and his mentor Vesemir following the breadcrumbs left behind on a deserted battlefield by Yennefer of Vengerberg, a powerful sorceress and Geralt's on-again, off-again love interest. The cinematic cuts between the past and the present, of Yennefer trying to survive in amongst an ongoing battle, and Geralt tracking Yennefer's movements. It does this by matching the location and the framing of the shots, like this. It's this graphic match cut which tells us that Geralt is looking for Yennefer without any dialogue necessary. The precision of those cuts too, with the framing being identical in both the past shots and the present shots, makes Geralt's tracking feel like it comes from a place of great skill. When we all know he's just holding a button and following the blurry orange line, his secret is safe with us. Fundamentally, it subtly reinforces how damn good Geralt is at what he does, all because of a simple cut. The more you look into cinematic techniques, the more you realise that directors treat us like dumb sheep to be guided through the story. Take the extreme close-up. When a director, and by extension an editor, decides to show you something in an extreme close-up shot, like this, it's usually because whatever they're showing you is really important, either for some meaning or because it's a setup for a later payoff. In David Fincher's movie Seven, we're shown close-ups of Detective William Somerset's metronome, which he turns on when he's trying to sleep. It's important because it represents his stability, so a later scene where he breaks it is more impactful in communicating his feeling of a loss of control. 
Then, in Blade Runner, there's the origami unicorn left for Deckard by Gaff. In the context of Deckard's daydreams about unicorns earlier in the film, it's meant to symbolise the ambiguity over whether Deckard is or is not a replicant. In the cinematic trailer A Night to Remember, Geralt is hunting a Bruxer, a particularly dangerous type of vampire. There are three specific uses of extreme close-up here. As Geralt enters the barn where the Bruxer is hiding away, the camera cuts to an extreme close-up of his Witcher medallion, which is shaking. In Witcher lore, medallions worn by witches react in this way to the presence of magical items or beings. It's shaking violently enough here that it tells us that this Bruxer is going to be a tough foe. But Geralt does a pretty good job of keeping his cool throughout this scene. I don't know about you, but if that were me, I'd be shitting myself. There's also the close-up of a moon dust bomb hooked onto Geralt's belt, which he uses almost immediately to expose the Bruxer, dusting its invisible body in sparkling bits of moon dust. It is, in effect, a really sped-up example of setup payoff. Seeing Geralt reach for it without having to focus shows off just how prepared he is and how routine something like this is for him. It's just part of the day job for Geralt of Rivia, this whole monster-killing business, and that's impressive. Then we have the Droplet of Blood. After Geralt takes a swig from his potion bottle, his veins bulge, and we cut to an extreme close-up following a droplet of blood falling from his nose. As it hits the ground, the blood sizzles. At first, this seems like it's just a flashy visual effect, but then the Bruxer takes a big old bite of Geralt's shoulder. The Bruxer veins then bulge, and it begins to visibly strain and weaken before fleeing, only for Geralt to cut it down with a silver sword. The payoff. This means Geralt expected to be bitten by the Bruxer, drank the potion in anticipation, and worked it in his plan to take it down. Geralt of Rivia intended to be chomped on by a vampire and exploited it. What a f***ing badass. Slow motion in all its forms can serve a variety of different purposes. In The Matrix, directed by the Wachowski sisters, so-called Bullet time is used to build tension and exaggerate Neo's superhuman bullet-dodging reflexes. In Zack Snyder's Spartan Epic 300, an effect is used where the shot rapidly cycles between standard speed and slow motion to show us the precision of every move the Spartans make in combat, and to add intensity and impact to each blow, slash, and stab. And in Guy Ritchie's Sherlock, when Holmes is wrestling in a bare-knuckle fistfight, the shot goes into slow motion as he monologues the logic and precision of his attacks. Here, that use of slow motion to showcase skill is very blatant and at the forefront of the viewing experience. Watching Sherlock's opponent's flappy face wobble about after being punched is really funny, too. In A Night to Remember, Geralt's fight with the Bruxer uses slow motion in a similar way to how it's used in 300, cycling between regular speed and bullet time to add punch to every blow. It also serves to ramp up the tension. With how the Bruxer has been built up to be this imposing opponent through all those extreme close-ups, and because it just looks really bloody scary, we know that the stakes are high. Slowing things down between each moment of impact holds us in place and forces us to watch things unfold in painstaking detail. We know each strike is coming, and drawing that anticipation out is really effective at making your chest tighten. In Killing Monsters, that slow-mo gives us a taste of just how skilled a fighter Geralt really is. He's moving at lightning speed in real time and slowing things down so we can see the intricacies of how he moves and where he strikes, juxtaposed just how fast he's actually making those combat decisions, really puts into perspective his fighting prowess. I mean, fuck, just look at the way he stabs that guy in the armpit. Unforgivingly savage, that is. This one isn't actually Geralt, which is cheating a little bit, but I love Yennefer enough that it doesn't particularly matter. 
In the Trails flashback sequences where we see the Wengerberg sorceress navigating the battlefield, there's a scene where she picks up a stone and casts it towards an oncoming cavalry charge. We see a side-on shot of the horses galloping, the thumping of hooves, and the clouds of mud and dirt reminding us just how heavy horses are, and then an extreme close-up of the stone at about half speed, tumbling down to the ground. We don't yet know what this stone will do, and delaying the reveal using slow motion gives us time for our minds to race and imagine what could possibly happen. Cutting very suddenly out of slow motion and into the cacophony of explosive, ground-lifting, smashy violence makes the whole ordeal more shocking and intense, and hammers home how powerful a sorcerer Yennefer is. For fans of the Witcher series, Geralt's stone-cold awesomeness isn't something that really needs to be highlighted. There had been two games before The Witcher 3 that did a good enough job of communicating that throughout their runtimes. But The Witcher 3 was the first of the three games to properly bring Geralt of Rivia into the mainstream consciousness, and so CD Projekt Red had to make sure people knew as quickly and as effectively as possible that the main protagonist of their game was a Chad who f**ks. Like many cinematic techniques, the tricks they used in these trailers aren't immediately obvious, nor do you consciously notice them. But they're there, and they have an impact on how we perceive Geralt as a character. Through these trailers, CD Projekt Red are having a conversation with our subconscious mind in a language we all know whether we realise it or not. It's a bit like Inception, really. And that's quite magical, isn't it? What other games would you like me to analyse like their films? Let us know in the comments. I really loved picking apart these trailers for The Witcher 3, and if you enjoyed it too, why not like this video and subscribe to Rock Paper Shotgun to see more videos like this. Cheers very much for watching, and hopefully see you again soon.